Jane Topham was an American serial killer who is known to have murdered 12 people in Massachusetts between 1895 and 1901, although she is suspected to have murdered many more. She said she wanted to have killed more people, helpless people, than any other man or woman who ever lived. Jane Topham was born in Nora Kelly in Boston, Massachusetts in 1857. She was the daughter of impoverished Irish Catholic immigrants. Little is known of Honora's mother, Bridget Kelly, who died of tuberculosis when Honora was very young. Her father, Peter Kelly, was a volatile, ill-tempered and violent drunk known as Kelly the Crack, as in crackpot. His erratic behaviour was well known and was the subject of many stories and rumours. For example, it is claimed he sewed his own eyes closed while working as a tailor, and although this story remains unsubstantiated, it does support the opinion that Kelly the Crack was a highly dysfunctional character whose sanity was in question. In later life, Kelly the Crack was sent to an insane asylum because he was violently deranged. In 1863, a few years after his wife's death, Kelly took his two youngest children, eight-year-old Delia and six-year-old Honora, to the Boston Female Asylum, an orphanage for what were called indigent female children. Indigent means suffering from extreme poverty. The orphanage was founded by Mrs. Hannah Stillman in 1800 in the city's South End and was home to over a hundred orphaned and destitute girls. Its mission was to receive, protect and instruct female orphans and then, at around the age of 10, place them in respectable families. When the orphanage board met and examined Delia and Honora, they promptly and unanimously concluded that the sisters had been neglected and that they had probably been abused, and therefore the sisters would stay at the orphanage. Kelly never saw Delia and Honora again. It was later said that the older sister, Nellie, who was not committed to the orphanage, became a prostitute and alcoholic, and that she went violently insane in her mid-twenties and was committed to an insane asylum. In 1864, less than two years after being abandoned by her father, Honora, aged eight, was separated from her sister and placed into indentured servitude in the home of Mrs. Anne C. Toppen of Laurel, Massachusetts. Indentured servitude is a form of labour where an individual is contracted to work for a set period without salary, and Honora was contracted to live and work as a servant in the Toppen household in return for her care. Before Honora was born, the potato crop in Ireland had failed due to the disease of potato blight, causing the Irish potato famine. Prospects in Ireland were grim, and many Irish left Ireland with around two million of them sailing to North America. In the nine years between 1846 and 1855, 37,000 of these immigrants arrived in Boston directly from Ireland. The Protestant city was neither prepared nor amenable to this influx of Irish Catholics. The anti-immigration movement gained significant support and blamed Irish immigration for many of the city's problems. Furthermore, the temperance movement, which associated sobriety with morality, had advanced significantly. Irish immigrants were often poorly educated and had a strong culture of social drinking. The temperance movement and the anti-immigration movement combined to portray the new Irish arrivals as ignorant, hopeless drunkards. Because of this, and probably to distance Honora from her previous dysfunctional family, the Protestant Mrs. Anne Toppen renamed Honora Jane Toppen. Jane was never formally adopted by the Toppens, and she had a difficult relationship with her benefactor, Mrs. Anne Toppen, who was a strong disciplinarian. Mrs. Anne Toppen instructed Jane to behave less like the descendant of ill-educated Irish Catholic immigrants, and more like someone from an established Protestant Boston family. If Jane refused to comply, Mrs. Topham would shame and humiliate Jane about being a poor, rescued Irish Catholic orphan who no one wanted. Mrs. Topham would also administer corporal punishment in response to Jane's many lies and fantastical stories. Mrs. Topham also made it clear to Jane that her place in the household was as a servant, and she would punish Jane when she insinuated herself into the family. Mrs. Topham already had a daughter, Elizabeth. Elizabeth was around 19 years old when Jane arrived. Elizabeth was very fond of Jane and helped bring Jane up. She probably helped Jane with her reading, school homework and her general understanding of the world. In 
At school, Jane excelled at her academic work and her confidence grew. She became known for her lively, happy and outgoing demeanour, and she had some friends who enjoyed her company. However, many others in the school despised Jane for her outrageous lies and her willingness to frame other children for her many troublesome deeds. As a result, teachers described Jane as both brilliant and terrible. Jane was also taunted by other children because of her Catholic background. Jane, probably because of her difficult relationship with Mrs. Anne Toppen, developed a secret jealousy and hatred towards her foster sister, Elizabeth. In 1874, at the age of 18, Jane graduated from Laurel High School and the Toppens promptly freed Jane from her indenture. They also awarded her $50, which was a stipulation of the indenture contract. James seemed content and stayed in the Toppen household as a paid servant. When Mrs. Anne Toppen died, Jane was instructed to organise the funeral. Jane was excluded from the will and Elizabeth inherited the Toppen estate. Jane deeply resented this exclusion and it consolidated her secret hatred of Elizabeth. Jane continued to work for Elizabeth and Elizabeth continued to treat Jane well. A few years after Mrs. Anne Toppen's death, Elizabeth married Oromel Brigham, a local church deacon. Elizabeth and Oromel lived together in the Toppen estate. Some years after the marriage, for some unknown reason, Jane, now 28, abruptly moved out of the Toppen household. Elizabeth, who was still very fond of Jane, assured her that she was welcome to come back at any time. Jane would later claim that when she was a young woman, she was courted by a Laurel office worker who gave her an engagement ring, and the engagement ended after he moved west for work and fell in love with someone else. Jane said this made her feel suicidal and that she had attempted suicide on multiple occasions. In 1887, age 31, Jane enrolled at Cambridge Hospital to begin her training as a nurse. She was seen by her patients, colleagues and superiors as intelligent, hardworking and diligent. Jane would work long shifts without complaint and always appeared happy. This earned her the nickname Jolly Jane. However, Jane was a malicious gossip and she openly celebrated when some of the subjects of her stories were expelled from the hospital. She lied constantly about her background and told grandiose stories about herself and her imagined family. Jolly Jane was suspected of stealing money and jewellery, although she was never caught. Jolly Jane would openly state to her fellow trainees that her older patients were a burden and unworthy of treatment. As a result, many of Jolly Jane's fellow trainees grew to detest her dishonest, callous and vindictive behaviour. Unaware of this, her superiors regarded Jane as a highly motivated and effective trainee nurse. While working long shifts, Jolly Jane would become close to her patients. She would favour the vulnerable and the elderly, and she would spend considerable time alone with them. During this time, Jolly Jane also developed an interest in pharmacology, the science of drugs and how they act. She started experimenting on her patients with drugs such as morphine and atropine, and she manipulated medical records to conceal her activities. Jane became fascinated by the effects that morphine and atropine would have on her patients, and she became utterly fixated on watching her helpless victims drift in and out of consciousness. Jolly Jane went on to administer lethal doses so she could watch her patients die. She would also get into bed with her victims, kiss them, caress them, and whisper in their ear as they drifted into unconsciousness and eventual death. Jolly Jane later admitted she wanted to see death in their eyes and that she experienced immense sexual pleasure when her victims died. In 1887, Mrs. Amelia Finney was recovering overnight from an operation to remove an ulcer. Amelia was in a great deal of pain and was unable to sleep. She called for help and Jolly Jane, the night nurse, immediately appeared by her bedside. Jane looked odd, tense and excited. Jane comforted Amelia and reassured her that she would relieve her pain. Jane administered a bitter-tasting medicine and almost immediately Amelia felt her body numbing and she could feel herself falling asleep. Before she slipped into unconsciousness, Amelia felt someone get into bed with her, press against her, hold her and kiss her. Amelia also felt someone's fast and excited breath against her ear 
and heard Jolly Jane whisper that everything would be okay very soon. Jane pulled Amelia's eyelids open and gazed into her eyes. She then tried to administer more of the bitter medicine. Amelia clenched her lips and refused to drink. Fortunately, at that moment, something startled Jane, possibly someone entering the ward, and she immediately jumped out of the bed and left Amelia alone. The following morning, Amelia awoke and convinced herself that the horrific experience was so outlandish that it must have been a deeply disturbing fever dream. Amelia kept the experience to herself, and that same day she checked out of hospital. Although Jane's superiors had concerns about her obsession with autopsies, they were completely unaware of her homicidal activities. They were also unaware that Jane was poisoning her patients and taking them to the brink of death and then nursing them back to health. On the contrary, they saw Jane as a highly competent nurse who saved lives and they suggested that she should receive wider training at the prestigious Massachusetts General Hospital. And so, in 1889, at the age of 33, Jolly Jane Toppen began training at the Massachusetts General Hospital. At first, Jane excelled in her duties and she was temporarily promoted to head nurse. There was far greater scrutiny at the Massachusetts General Hospital and Jane's colleagues began speculating on the high number of deaths on her shifts and that she was falsifying medical records to hide her reckless administration of morphine. Jane's superiors, concerned by the rumours, investigated and concluded that these problems were the result of Jane's incompetence. Jane's fellow nurses also suspected Jane was using morphine and stealing money and jewellery from the hospital patients and staff. The hospital management became increasingly concerned about the rumours surrounding Jane. And so in the summer of 1890, when Jane broke an important rule and left the ward without permission, they took the opportunity and discharged her of her duties. The hospital management also refused Jane a nursing licence, even though she had passed the final and her diploma was signed. In the fall of 1890, after a short period working as a private nurse, Jane returned to the Cambridge Hospital to finish her nursing diploma. She was quickly dismissed by the hospital management for her reckless administration of opiates after the death of two patients in her care. Jane killed at least 12 people while working as a trainee nurse, although many believe the figure to be far higher. Although Jane did not serve enough time as a trainee nurse to receive her diploma, in the summer of 1891, she started her career as a private nurse. Jane had many excellent references from doctors who were unaware of her problems with hospital management or her homicidal nature. Jane forged any necessary paperwork. Jane worked for wealthy and established families around the Boston area and quickly established a reputation as a highly competent nurse. The doctors she worked with and the patients she treated believed Jane to be both kind and compassionate. Despite some frustration at Jane's dishonesty and complaints of petty theft, Jane's private nursing career flourished and she has established herself as the most successful private nurse in the Boston area. Jolly Jane Toppen continued to murder vulnerable people in her care. She poisoned infirm, older family members with morphine and atropine and stole their possessions. As the victims were elderly and infirm, their deaths were never deemed as suspicious. In 1895, age 38, Jane was lodging at Wendell Street, Cambridge, with her patient and landlord, 88-year-old Israel Dunham, and his wife, Lovely. Jane, irritated by how feeble and fussy Israel had become, decided to poison him. After Israel's death, Jane stayed on to care for his widow. Eventually, Jane decided to poison Lovely, who died in September 1897 at the age of 87. In 1899, at the age of 42, Jane rented a holiday home from the Davis family at Cape Cod. Jane invited her foster sister, Elizabeth Brigham, to holiday with her. Elizabeth, who still cared deeply for Jane, was delighted and accepted the invitation. On her arrival at the holiday home, Jane began to poison Elizabeth, and several days later, she suffered what was diagnosed by the visiting doctor as an apoplectic stroke, which left her in a coma. Elizabeth never recovered and died on August 29, 1899, at the age of 70. Jane later claimed that Elizabeth was the first victim that she truly hated. <laughs>
In January 1900, Jane visited Oromel at the Toppen Estate, where she poisoned Elizabeth's housekeeper, Florence Catkins, who died on January the 15th, 1900, aged 45. Jane probably killed Florence to further isolate Oromel. Jane also convinced Oromel that it was her sister Elizabeth's last wish for Jane to have her prized gold watch and chain. In February 1900, Jane visited her old friend Myra Connors, a dining matron at St. John's Theological School. Myra's position at the Theological School came with considerable level of social status and authority, and it also came with an apartment and a personal maid. After spending a few days with her, Jane poisoned Myra. After her death, Jane persuaded the Dean of the Theological School that Myra had planned to take a sabbatical due to poor health and was going to suggest Jane as her replacement. Jane went on to explain that Myra had instructed her on all the duties of the position. The Dean, impressed by Jane's demeanour, offered her the job. Jane's new colleagues quickly questioned her competence, complained about her dishonesty and raised concerns that she was stealing money. And so, in November of that year, Jane was dismissed from the job for financial irregularities. Jolly Jane continued her malign ways, and in 1901 she moved in with new landlords, Melvin and Eliza Beadle. Jane poisoned Melvin and Eliza, enough to cause them nausea, diarrhoea and vomiting. She then nursed them back to health to gain their confidence. During this time, Jane raised her concerns that the housekeeper, Mary Sullivan, had a drinking problem and was untrustworthy. Jane then poisoned Mary Sullivan, just enough that she would appear drunk while on duty. The Beadles promptly dismissed Mary Sullivan for insobriety and offered Jane the job as housekeeper, which she graciously accepted. Soon after this, the Davis family became increasingly concerned that Jane Topham was not paying the rent for the vacation cottage on Cape Cod. Jane was still in possession of the cottage and her rent arrears amounted to $500. Mary, known as Matty Davis, travelled to meet with Jane to resolve this problem. She found Jane at the Beadles. Jane invited Matty into the house and after a brief conversation, Jane offered Matty a drink, which was laced with morphine. Matty immediately fell ill and could barely stand. The Beadles offered Matty the spare room and called for a doctor. Jane explained to the doctor that Matty was a diabetic and that she had eaten cake soon after her arrival. The doctor, confident in Jane's diagnosis and her nursing abilities, left Matty in her care. Jane then toyed with Matty for a few days by bringing her in and out of consciousness for eventually killing Matty on July the 5th. The Davis family, impressed by Jane's compassionate care of Matty, invited her to stay with them at Catamat and care for Matty's elderly husband, Alden Davis. A few days after moving in, Jane started setting small fires in and around the house. Fortunately for the Davis family, the fires were quickly spotted and extinguished. Jane said that the likely culprit for the fires was a suspicious-looking man who she had seen loitering in the area. Jane also told the family she thought Alden's youngest daughter, Genevieve Gordon, who was staying at the house to comfort her father, was coping poorly with the death of her mother, Matty, and that the grief had made her suicidal. Jane then poisoned Genevieve, and she died on the 26th of July. Less than two weeks later, on August the 8th, Jane poisoned Alden Davis. He had $500 on him when he was murdered, and unbeknown to the family, Jane stole the money. Jane then attempted to convince Alden's oldest daughter, Minnie Gibbs, to write off the $500 of rent arrears Jane still owed the Davis family. Minnie refused. So a few days later, and less than a week after Alden's death, Jane poisoned Minnie. While Minnie lay dying, Jane later admitted to taking Minnie's 10-year-old son to bed with her. It is unknown whether Jane sexually assaulted the child. The whole Davis family were dead within 40 days, and this now raised suspicions. Unaware of these suspicions, Jane returned to her hometown of Lowell and to the Toppen family home with the plan of gaining control of the Toppen estate by marrying her foster sister's widow, Reverend Oromel Brigham, who had inherited the estate from Elizabeth. Oromel's sister, Edna Bannister, was also visiting the house to spend time with her brother. Jane saw Edna's presence as making it more difficult to stay in the house and manipulate Oromel, and so Jane began to poison Edna who died two days later. 
Jane attempted to win Oromel's affection by comforting during his grief. When this strategy failed, Jane poisoned Oromel and tried to win his love by nursing him back to health. When her advances were rejected yet again, she threatened to tell the town she was pregnant with Oromel's child. This was a lie, and Oromel demanded that Jane leave the house and never return. At this point, Jane poisoned herself with morphine, which was probably another attempt to gain Oromel's attention. She was taken to the Lowell General Hospital to recover from her supposed suicide attempt. A few days later, on the 29th of September, Jane left Laurel and retreated to New Hampshire to stay with an old friend, Sarah Nichols. In the meantime, Minnie's father-in-law, Captain Paul Gibbs, had raised his suspicions about Minnie's sudden death with Genevieve's husband, Harry Gordon. Captain Gibbs did not accept that Minnie had died of natural causes, as she had always been so healthy. He had challenged Jane when she injected Minnie with a medication, and he found her response to be odd although he decided not to pursue the issue at the time, as he was worried he may have misunderstood the situation and did not want to worry Minnie and the family. Harry, too, had concerns about Jane and told Captain Gibbs that while Minnie was in bed, incapacitated, she seemed fearful when Jane was present. He had not raised the issue with Jane or the family for fear of being mistaken. On the 31st of October, Captain Gibbs contacted the leading toxicologist in Massachusetts, Leonard Wood, to discuss his suspicion that Jane had poisoned the Davis family. He demanded the bodies of the Davis family be exhumed and autopsies carried out. Jane read about this in the newspaper while she was staying with Oromel in Lowell, just before her supposed suicide attempt. Some believe Jane's suicide attempt was motivated by fear that her crimes were about to be discovered. However, it seems unlikely Jane had much fear of being caught as she had now been killing people and getting away with it for over a decade. She was also highly practiced and highly confident in her abilities as a poisoner, and she knew it would be difficult, if not impossible, for the authorities to demonstrate murder from a toxicology report. Also, Jane understood the effects of morphine and atropine. She knew what would constitute a lethal dose, and it is unlikely that she would have unintentionally failed to commit suicide. When the bodies of the Davis family were exhumed, State Detective General Yofanis Whitney was assigned to investigate the deaths, and a State Police Detective, John Patterson, was assigned to monitor Jane's activities. Patterson had followed Jane to Lowell, and he even disguised himself as a patient so he could continue to keep track of her during her stay at the Lowell General Hospital while she was recovering from her morphine overdose. The toxicology report subsequently revealed that Minnie Gibbs was poisoned with arsenic, and on the 29th of October 1901, Jane Topham was arrested and charged with her murder. When Amelia Finney heard that Jane Topham had been arrested for murder, she immediately realised that her experience in Cambridge Hospital with nurse Jane Topham was not a fever dream, and she contacted the police to tell her story. The police investigation was hindered as most of the wealthy families who had employed Jane as a nurse wanted nothing to do with the murder investigation for fear of reputational damage. Jane awaited trial in the Barnstable jailhouse, where she made friends with the jailer's wife, who she was able to convince that she was innocent. Jane appeared in court on the 31st of October for her arraignment where the state detailed how Jane Toppen had poisoned her victims with arsenic. Jane confidently pleaded not guilty, and the toxicology results were quickly demonstrated as useless, as the embalming fluid used to preserve the body for the funeral arrangements were predominantly made of arsenic, and this contaminated the results. At this point, Captain Gibbs, who believed Jane to be too intelligent to have used arsenic to murder Minnie, proposed that Jane would more likely have used drugs such as morphine and atropine. The doctors who performed the autopsy agreed, and they found congestion in some blood vessels typical of morphine poisoning. The doctors also strongly suspected atropine had been used in the murders, but could not prove it because of the way the drug is metabolised by the body. Jane was officially charged with four counts of murder the entire Davis family. She pleaded not guilty. While in jail, Jane was visited many times by a panel of alienists 
The term alienist likely comes from the French and referred to someone who treated the insane. Therefore, alienist can be considered an early type of psychiatrist. During these visits, Jane confessed to 12 murders and claimed she was driven by an irresistible sexual impulse to kill. She also said her preferred poisons were morphine and atropine, as they were difficult to detect. The panel conducted many extensive interviews with Jane, and they eventually concluded that Jane Topham was morally insane. Moral insanity was a medical diagnosis that described a mental disorder consisting of abnormal emotions and behaviours in the apparent absence of intellectual impairments, delusions or hallucinations. The alienist also concluded that Jane was a highly untrustworthy individual, socially manipulative and a danger to everyone around her. On the 23rd of June, the trial of Jane Topham began at the Barnstable County Courthouse. The trial took less than eight hours and the jury deliberated for less than 30 minutes. Convinced by the evidence provided by the alienist, the jury found Jane not guilty by reason of insanity. Jane was committed to life in the Taunton Insane Hospital. Jane, who did not speak at her trial, appeared elated with the verdict. On the 24th of June 1902, Jane entered the Taunton Insane Hospital. She smiled and waved to a crowd of curiosity seekers as she was escorted through the gates. It was later discovered that Jane had confessed to her lawyer and longtime friend James Stuart Murphy that she had committed 31 murders. She also said she wanted the panel of alienists to find her insane, as she naively believed that in a few months' time she would convince them she was no longer insane and she would then be released. In the Taunton Insane Hospital, Jane was mostly a model patient and she did attempt to show she had some feelings of remorse. Jane said that being jilted by her lover, the office worker in Laurel, was the cause of all her problems. Jane explained, if she had been a married woman, she probably would not have killed these people. She went on to say that she would have had her husband, her children and her home to take up her mind. Jane would freely admit to her known murders, although she was unclear as to how many people she had killed, saying that there were so many that she had forgotten. She talked about the exquisite pleasure she felt when killing people and how she could not resist the excitement of murder. She reveled in the idea that she had killed more people than any known poisoner in history, and she was amazed at her own ability to not feel guilt or remorse. During her time at Taunton, Jane showed no signs of genuine remorse. The hospital staff also observed that Jane showed no empathy or sympathy towards her fellow patients, and that she would become excited when she knew other patients were in trouble or distress. She enjoyed the suffering of other patients and would giggle like a silly child when she saw patients in pain. Jane had few friends in the hospital and complained that she was in the wrong place as she was not insane and that she was not like the other patients who were erratic, uneducated and unable to look after themselves. Jane also experienced a great deal of paranoia and thought that people were poisoning her. As a result, she stopped eating and lost a great deal of weight. Over the three and a half decades Jane spent in Taunton, her mental and physical state slowly deteriorated, and on the 17th of August 1938, at the age of 81, Jane Toppen died of natural causes. She is buried in an unmarked grave in the paupers section of the Mayflower Hill Cemetery in Taunton. As Jane was a convicted homicidal social predator who ruthlessly charmed and manipulated her way through life, without any sense of guilt or remorse. Many have begun to suspect she was a psychopath. Psychopathy is a cluster of interpersonal, emotional, lifestyle and antisocial traits and behaviours, including grandiosity, egocentricity, deceptiveness, shallow emotions, lack of empathy, irresponsibility, impulsivity, lack of guilt or remorse, and a tendency to violate social rules. Psychopathy is rare in the general population. About 1% of adults meet the diagnostic criteria. It is common among serious criminals and affects 15 to 25% of incarcerated individuals at some level. The causes of psychopathy are not fully understood. It seems psychopathy is primarily hereditary with environmental factors influencing how it develops. Psychopaths show differences and abnormalities in areas of the brain 
that control emotions, social interactions, ethics, morality, regret, impulsivity, and conscience. For people with inherited vulnerability to psychopathy, environmental influences may increase or reduce their chance of developing this disorder. Environmental risk factors include a convicted parent, physical neglect, poverty, low social status, a disrupted family, abuse, harsh discipline, having a young mother, having a depressed mother, poor housing, a delinquent sibling, and bullying by peers. The main protective factor is highly warm and responsive parenting. As psychopathy is primarily hereditary, Jane probably had a genetic predisposition to psychopathy, which she may have inherited from her father, Kelly the Crack, as he lacked empathy and had poor behavioural controls. Jane had many environmental risk factors for psychopathy. For example, Jane was physically neglected and probably abused by Kelly the Crack. Also, Kelly the Crack may be considered a convict, as he was sent to an insane asylum. Her dysfunctional family were very poor, of low social status, and lived in abject housing conditions. It is also possible that her older sister, Nellie, who developed mental health problems and was sentenced to an insane asylum, was quite delinquent in our modern definition. During these early years, Jane had little to no protective factors against psychopathy, such as highly warm and responsive parenting. As her mother died when Jane was very young and Kelly the Crack was erratic, ill-tempered and abusive. The sanctuary of the orphanage and the warm and responsive care provided by the staff may have provided some protection against psychopathy. The Toppins provided Jane with structure, a safe place to live and a good education. And Elizabeth's care and affection towards Jane was also quite possibly protective against psychopathy. However, Mrs. Ann Toppin's physical punishment for Jane's poor behaviour may have been harsh. And if it was, this would also be a risk factor for psychopathy. Even if it's not clear if Mrs. Ann Toppin's physical punishments were harsh, belittling and humiliating Jane for her origins, as Mrs. Ann Toppin did, would only have exacerbated matters. It is worth mentioning that Mrs. Ann Toppin's punishment of Jane may have been a response to Jane's emerging psychopathic traits, which would have been very difficult for Mrs. Ann Toppin to manage. Jane also experienced some bullying by her peers due to her impoverished Irish Catholic background. Bullying by peers is another risk factor for psychopathy. It is important to note that psychopathy can and does develop even without these environmental risk factors. To evaluate psychopathy, modern forensic psychological assessment tools are used such as Hare's Psychopathic Checklist. Hare's Checklist assesses psychopathy as a stable set of personality traits characterised by a lack of conscience or a sense of guilt and remorse, low empathy, high egocentricity, shallow emotions, pathological lying, disregard for law and social convention, and a history of victimising others. It is important to note that Hare's Checklist is only valid if administered by a suitably qualified and experienced clinician under scientifically controlled and licensed conditions. In addition, it requires a semi-structured interview and a review of the file records and case history. With those caveats, we can say that Jane showed many of the traits that are revealed by the checklist. Although she had friends and displayed superficial charm, she also had an inflated and grandiose sense of her own self-worth. She needed high levels of stimulation, and she was a pathological liar. She was manipulative and lacked any feelings of guilt or remorse. She felt no empathy for her victims and was callous and uncaring, even voicing her disdain for elderly patients. She led a parasitic lifestyle, killing for money, valuables and property. And she was also a versatile criminal committing fraud and forging documents, prescriptions and references. She was impulsive with seeming little ability to control her behaviour. Given these stable personality traits, along with her aspiration to be the deadliest killer ever known and her murder of many innocent and often vulnerable people, many people now believe Jolly Jane Toppin was, in our current definition, a psychopath, that she fully understood the consequence of her actions.
Jane Toppen simply didn't care about the lives she took, and she lacked the basic human capacities that enable us to value and care about other people.